Good morning, all of you brothers and sisters. It's just great to be with you all. What a privilege and honor it is to be with you all in this OM uh, International Leaders uh, meeting here like this and understand this is the, your largest gathering ever of your ILM meeting. My wife and I, we arrived quite late last night. I sat at the back, we sat at the back and I looked from the back and I thought, my goodness, this is a group of largely balding eagles. I know, 50 years as a movement is quite some time. <laughs> the comfort I want to offer you all as an offer Peter Maiden last night is that great men show up at the top. <laughs> I know I've been asked to do this four mornings of Bible readings and uh, I'm conscious of the fact about time Jonathan, when do I finish? Is there a time limit for me? Whatever. Or oh, 10.30, am I right? Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, I wouldn't take that long, maybe. Well, we'll see how we go, all right, with, with regards to time. Just re it just reminds me of uh, a, a, a man being invited to the pulpit to preach by his dear friend. And, uh, and he took his really own sweet time to preach. And uh, he went over time, and a friend was seated at the back, was trying to make all kinds of sounds to attract his attention, to let him know that his time was over. He went on preaching, okay? And uh, he quietly slipped a note up to him and said, your time is really over. But he carried on preaching, and he was so frustrated, he looked around to see what he could do to stop him, he saw a hymnal by his side. He took the hymnal and he threw at him. <laughs> but the hymnal missed him and hit the old lady in front on the first row. Maybe that's why nobody's sitting here in front. <laughs> hit her on the head and she fell over. And as she was sinking into unconsciousness, she shouted out, I can still hear him, hit me again. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are kind enough not to treat me like this. <laughs> As I was praying through, what is it the Lord would want me to speak and to share over these next four mornings with you? I thought it would be good for me really to take a book uh, of uh, Scripture, a book of the New Testament, 1 Peter, really to focus our attention about what God would have us at this time, this season, I trust in the life of O.M., here. What an incredible work that I see that God has raised up OM to be in the last 50 years. And I really, friends, thank God uh, for all that God has done in and through OM. That through a small band of men who got together 50 years ago, this work and ministry has gone to 114 countries around the world. This is just amazing, friends. And I want to commend you all. Uh, for the great, wonderful, powerful work. I have entitled this series of uh, meditations over the next four mornings as simply living in challenging but exciting times. Living in challenging but exciting times. Why is this? Because in the world that we are living in, we find that we are really blessed as well as encouraged by what God is doing around the world, isn't it? These are exciting days to live in. What we are seeing, for example, about God doing it in India, and the report last night we were given is just really so gratifying, is, and we give praise and thanks to God. We also see God at work in China in a dramatic manner, whereby not only we find that God is advancing His kingdom in the rural places all over China, it is likewise happening, friends, right in cities there in China. Even at the highest intellectual level in universities, we find that lecturers and professors are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But more than that, we find that they are also starting Bible study groups themselves. And this is really exciting. In fact, a former premier of China himself on a private occasion said, what China needs is Christianity. And this is increasingly, friends, the echo of many Chinese Christians across China. 
And we thank God for what he is doing right that in that part of the world. Likewise, we hear about the Muslim world and what God is doing. We thank God for the advance of his kingdom there in Algeria and what a delight it is to be there to see that incredible work that Yusuf and the team are putting together in that place. We thank God likewise, hearing about reports last night, but here, there, and everywhere. I thank God the lasers I got about Egypt is that God is breaking forth in signs, wonders, and miracles. Some incredible thing has been happening. This just comes back to me just two weeks ago, whereby God is appearing in a vision in an Orthodox Coptic church there in Cairo itself of Mary holding a cross. And this has drawn tons of Muslims to the church, knowing that this has to be Isa al Masih, Jesus the Messiah, who has revealed himself uh, to the people there uh, in Cairo and in Egypt as well. There is even, friends, an image of a huge white dove that will fly across Cairo City. And this has been seen by quite a number of people. And it eventually collapses into a cross. This is something amazing, never seen before. And God is breaking forth, friends, in signs, wonders, miracles in a powerful manner. We see this happening right across Asia, in Africa, as well as in Latin America as well. We just came back from Brazil, and what a powerful time it is to see God at work in a mighty manner. There in Brazil, as we know, today something like 25% of the population are today born-again Christians. And therefore, we find that God is just breaking forth in revivals in a powerful manner in that part of the world. And what a delight it is just to be there to minister to the people. In fact, as you all know, we talk about the British being mad about football. Wait until they go to Brazil. I asked the Brazilians in the three churches, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Pentecostal church, how many of you think Brazil will win the World Cup? Practically every hand went up all right, in these congregations of thousands in each one of them. And I said, you know what? I believe uh, God has no choice but to allow Brazil to win. Because not only are you crazy about football, 45 million of your evangelical born Christians will be praying for Brazil to win. <laughs> I suppose God has no choice but to make Brazil to win like this, isn't it? But friends, God is doing amazing work around the world and it is really exciting. And this is one of the best days to live in the history of the church. And all you who agree say, Amen. It's what exciting days it is. But we also recognize, friends, these days are challenging days. Days that are really stretching us in so many different dimensions whereby we know that faith will have to arise to live out the kind of discipleship that is, will increasingly, friends, for all of us be costly, no doubt. And that's the reason why I felt that the book of 1 Peter will speak to us so very well, really, as we meditate on it the next four mornings together. And so this morning, I'm going to speak on the subject of living in hope from the first chapter of Peter and going on to chapter 2, verse 12. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to speak about living under authority. And then the third morning, I'm going to talk about living under suffering, what it means and how do we respond in the light of this. And then finally, we're going to talk about living as leaders and followers. And that's so crucial, friends, isn't it? Increasingly, as we work together for the advance of God's kingdom, because one of the things that the enemy wants to do to, would be to divide leaders and followers. And if we cannot work together as a team and produce real synergy, we know that our work in any part of the world will be dramatically affected. And that's the reason why it is important, friends, for you and I to look into this as we allow Apostle Peter to speak to us from his book like this. And so this morning, I'm going to speak about living in hope, which is really such an important and crucial subject for all of us because this is something that is unique to God's people, the whole area of hope, the whole area of having that trust and confidence, knowing that at the end of it all, we as God's people will win. Amen. It is because Jesus Christ has won. And that's why we, you and I as God's people continue to stand there confidently, knowing that in hope, the battle will be won, really one day, because Jesus Christ has won uh, the victory. Let us pray together as we come to the Word of God. Our Father, we want to give you thanks and praise, O oh God, for your grace of goodness towards us. These are exciting days, but these are challenging days as well. And Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your Word. And this morning as we come, Father, to the book of 1 Peter, 
We pray, O oh God, you will speak to us. Spirit of God, take this word of yours that you've inscribed and inspired and make it come alive to us. So that together, Father, we pray, we will respond to your word and live it out to your honor and for your glory. We give you praise and thanks, our Father, for all this. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Living in hope, we find Apostle Peter starts off in verse 1 by saying, Peter, an apostle, a very simple, quick introduction, is sent out one from God with the mission to fulfill here on earth. And Peter then addresses himself to God's elect here, strangers in the world, isn't it? It's interesting, all right? Strangers in the world. In other words, Peter is reminding these believers who are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, that the, we are pilgrims on earth, that our roots are not meant to be here on earth forever, that we are people who are travelers, as it were, on the way to our eventual destiny, which is really the city of God. And that's a call, friends, of God's people in this regard like this. And then Peter goes on to say in verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. And so Peter here tells us, therefore, that it is the Father who chooses, and then secondly, it is the Son who cleanses us through His sprinkled blood. And then finally, it is the Spirit who consecrates through His sanctifying work in our hearts, in our lives. What an incredible privilege, isn't it, for you and I to be called, to be chosen, to be cleansed, as well as to be consecrated for God's work and for God's glory like this. And then Peter very quickly moves on to pronounce a blessing. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And we all know, friends, as Peter is writing this book, it is writing in the context of sufferings, the real sufferings in the light of the rule of the wicked emperor Nero at that time from AD 37 to 68. And so when Apostle Peter was writing this, we find that Peter was very conscious that it was at a very height of the persecution of Christians of the Church of Jesus Christ at a point of time. And Peter is writing to the Christians scattered in these regions, which is part of modern Turkey and the surrounding region that form a major part of the Roman Empire at a point of time. And so therefore Peter is reminding them that there is the work, an incredible work of God, who has chosen us, called us, drawn us to himself, changed and transformed us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be set aside for the purpose of God. And Peter, in that context, recognized that in the midst of sufferings how much of God's grace as well as peace that is required, isn't it? How much of the unmerited favor of God that is released upon his people as well as the whole area of the sustaining grace and power of God that would be needed in great abundance to live out one's Christian life and faith like this. Peter moves on then very quickly to express praise to God. Why does he praise God here? We are told right by the Apostle Peter in this manner, verse 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We here talks about the whole area of praise to God, and the reason for praise to God, Peter says, is because we are born into a living hope. And that's so important, as I said, for all of us, whole area of hope that is alive, that is real, that is dynamic, that is one whereby we can confidently look towards the future, isn't it? And that's the reason, my friends, you and I as God's people are people who always live in hope. People who are never defeated in spite of whatever the circumstance we're going through. That we can confidently march on knowing that He is there for us and with us. What is the reason? The reason here Peter says is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The fact of the resurrection, the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead is a confident hope that gives to all of us that as we are in Christ, we shall likewise know the victory because nothing can hold us back, not even death at all, isn't it? And that's the reason why, friends, as God's people, sometimes in spite of the challenges we are faced with, we press on having this great hope, knowing that one day we shall be 
the one who will win at the end of it all. But Peter also talks secondly about this praise as a guaranteed inheritance, you see, because here in verse, in verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade, kept in heaven for you. A sure inheritance that you and I have a certain future that you and I share in, like this, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, he emphasizes the whole area of the place of faith in verse 5. Peter says, who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Who through faith, and friends, you know, you and I, as God's people, faith is a crucial element, isn't it, in our discipleship. And it's a concern for all of us. And this is what, for example, in my church, I'm seeking to build. That in my congregation, I said, I want to build a faith community, not just a believing faith, but a faith that dares to trust God for big things and great things. Amen, isn't it? And it's so important for all of us in any movement when there's a lack of faith, we're in deep trouble, friends. Isn't it? And so it is so crucial for us in Christ to rise up to dare to believe with big faith because of a great God, isn't it? This wonderful God that we have draws us to dare to trust Him. And the exciting things, friends, for all of us is that what I really find that is so gratifying is that increasing measure of faith is rising up around the world in God's people. For example, recently I was talking to a whole group of young pastors in Malaysia. And uh, we were called uh, by them as fathers in the faith, as we're in the nation, to interact with them, share with them, help them to get a dream big uh, for the nation. And I said, what I'm really encouraged about is looking at a whole group of young, younger pastors. I said, not a whole bunch of you, because bunch refers to monkeys. Whole group of you, younger pastors. I said, what I'm delighted, excited about is a whole area of faith that you dare and you want to trust God for big things and great things. And that's important for us because why? We need to be involved in building a faith community that believes in signs, wonders, healings, miracles to take place that believes, friends, in the midst of all these things, people encounter God in Jesus Christ in a powerful manner. Isn't it? And that's what is required for all of us, friends. And that's why I'm really excited about what God is doing in so many places around the world as He raises up men and women of faith to do great, powerful exploits for God. And so that's what Apostle Peter emphasizes here, that when there is faith, and this faith is shielded by God's power, protected by God's power, we can then march on trusting Him as to what he is going to bring to pass. Now, how is this praise to be expressed? How is this praise to be expressed? Apostle Peter tells us here in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. This faith is to be expressed in a whole area of rejoicing, friends, of really rejoicing in the whole area of the fact that in spite of all that is taking place, we find it, we can rejoice in the midst of trials. That you and I as God's people, we can press on in this because our faith will be tested, will be proven to see whether it is real or not in the midst of trials like this. Isn't and that's why Peter writes here in verse 7, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even the refined by fire, may prove genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Friends, God allows us to go to the fires of testing in order to prove whether the faith of ours will be strong, will be fervent, and will continue to hold on. And friends, we find it, it's a reminder to us about the Lord Jesus Christ says to us. Isn't it? Because in John 15, we find Jesus Christ says to us uh, in this manner, in verse 18, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. You see, friends, when we belong to the world, the world would tap us on our back and say, well done, you are part of us, you are no threat to us. But when we belong to Jesus Christ, we find we become a threat to friends around us who do not know Jesus Christ. 
In fact, they'll begin to hate us. And Jesus tells us, they hate you because they've hated me first. They hate you because you have genuine faith in me. And this is what happens, friends, when there is faith in Christ. Peter reminds us there is this whole area of the possibility of our faith being tested to show whether it's real, it's genuine, or not like this. And so, friends, we find that we can rejoice because it proves that our faith is real, it's genuine in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, friends, when we go to these trials, we find that it produces a desire uh, in us. And this desire here is expressed in verses 8 and 9, where Peter writes uh, in this manner. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so here Peter says to all of us, it will produce a desire. And this desire is one whereby it will cause us to want to love him more and more. Friends, when we are going through hardships and pains and sufferings and difficulties, something works in us very, very deeply, causing us to recognize the whole area of the reality of God. Is God real in us? And if God is real in us, friends, we find that we want to draw closer. We decide to draw closer to Him because at the end, it is He who will sustain us. It is He who will enable us to continue to press on to be faithful and desiring to be faithful to all the way to the end. Not only, friends, to love Him, but it also says that to believe in Him and that you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Because why? At the end of the goal of your faith, it is the salvation of your souls. It leads at the end of your to know that we are secure in Christ because our souls are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this salvation, friends, we are told is really very precious. That's the reason why we find here that in verses 10 to 12, we find Peter writes in this manner about the preciousness of our salvation, therefore, as a result. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you search intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances for which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent for heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. And so this preciousness of our salvation, friends, is really played out in two dimensions. Firstly, we are told that the prophets themselves, they search intently as to when this suffering of Christ would be, and therefore the glory to be revealed at the end of it all. And so we find, friends, through the Old Testament, prophets again and again, they were really seeking and searching and looking really at the end of it all as to when is it, that this Messiah that has been prophesied would come, really. And what is it like when he comes? And we are told in the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah 53, that this servant who is going to come is a suffering servant. It's a servant himself who understands the pains and heartaches of going through what it means to suffer. And that's the reason why, friends, we find that this faith of ours and the salvation to follow is something that is really precious indeed. On top of that, we find the Holy Spirit will reveal to them likewise. And so in verse 12 here, we are told, It was revealed to them, they are not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preach to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. You see, at the end of it, as much as the prophets themselves searched to find out when is it exactly the sufferings of Christ will be revealed, it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God is at work in and to the lives of the prophets to make known at the end of it all the salvation that is to come. And that's the reason why, friends, we find that it will produce a desire in us to want to love Him, to want to believe in Him more and more, and to be able to really appropriate to know how precious the salvation of ours is. Amen. And it's so important for us, friends, to know at the end of it all 
our lives, our souls are secured in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are therefore like this. And that's what Apostle Peter is trying to tell us. That on one hand, the prophets, but also on the other hand, we notice here the whole area of the Spirit of God at work in trying to make known to all of us what it means to live out the plan and purpose uh, of the Lord in this uh, manner like this. And then, friends, we notice here this Precious salvation must therefore result in us knowing how we live out our lives, how we live out our faith as well as our discipleship in this regard. And so we notice, friends, Apostle Peter tells us like this in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's the first thing, friends, about how we are supposed to be living in this world, that our minds are to be ready for action. Now, this mind of ours that God has given to us, it is an incredible thing. This mind of ours is one way, but it determine many times our response to things around us. This mind of ours is the most precious of it all. And that's the reason why we find that every human regime they're all trying to capture this mind, influence this mind, including, of course, the advertising world, isn't it? And there's a reason why we find that sometimes the advertising world, there is so much out to try to capture the minds, not just of adults, but also children as well. That if we ask our children, for example, after Sunday service, where should we go for lunch? In the case of Malaysian children, for example, if we ask them after church, where kids should we go for lunch? automatically they will all say McDonald's or KFC. If your kid were to say, Mom and Dad, we shall not go to KFC McDonald's, but something Malaysian, because we are Malaysia, we're in Malaysia here, I want to tell you a miracle has happened to your kid. <laughs> it just shows how much of influence that has taken place in the minds of our kids. Why? Because, as I said, every regime and every person involved in advertising will be up to capture this, isn't it? And God knows that. And that's the reason we find that Scripture tells us a lot of things about the mind. Of course, it recognizes our mind has been warped. Our mind has been defiled. And therefore, this mind will need to be renewed, isn't it? And so that's the reason why in Romans right, chapter 12, we find Apostle Paul writes in this manner for all of us. I forgot to mention that I'm reading, right, uh, from the NIV, that's the version that I use from Scripture because I was asked just now what version of the Bible I use. I said NIV. Why? Because it is the never incorrect version. <laughs> so Romans 12, uh, Apostle Paul writes here in verse 2 like this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed in what way? Beginning with the mind. This mind has to be renewed. And until and unless this mind is renewed, you and I cannot think Christianly. And that's so crucial for us, isn't it? We must be able to think Christianly first before we can respond and live out radically for Jesus. And so that's the reason why we find that this mind must be occupied with the right kind of things, isn't it, for us. And so the Apostle Paul, writing to Philippian Christians, he tells us like this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is how our minds are meant to be occupied. Occupied with that which is good, lovely, pure, excellent, praiseworthy. So that when our minds are occupied with these things that are right and proper, what comes up from us is also right and proper. What comes up from a response will also be appropriate as well, isn't it? I think we're all familiar with the computer term, gigo, G-I-G-O, isn't it? Garbage in, garbage out. And so when we fill our minds with garbage, with things that are not right, what comes up from our life, likewise, would be things that are not right uh, at all. And so it is very important for you and I, friends, 
to really get into, for example, to begin with, for a start, the Word of God that will renew our minds. That this book that has been inspired by the living God himself will be one whereby as it seeps through us again and again, will begin to help us to think, right? To be renewed, to be redirected, so that our life and our wills will be really moved in the direction that will honor God in every way indeed. And that's the reason why I'm so pleased really here at this, uh, your leaders meeting and time and again throughout the whole ministry of OM, there's a tremendous emphasis on the word of God, which is really so important for all of us, isn't it? That when the word is preached, it will begin to speak to us, our life, it will begin to renew our mind and transform us and help us therefore to respond uh, rightly uh, and properly like this. And so there's the first thing we notice, friends, Apostle Peter is concerned about preparing our minds for action, but this mind can only be prepared for action rightly and properly, provided it is renewed, so that it will be able really to think radically for the Lord in a right manner. But Paul, uh, sorry, Peter here goes on further to say, and be self-controlled as well, not only to have our minds renewed so we can respond rightly, but to have our wills under control so that it is directed really rightly and properly by the Spirit of the living God, isn't it? This world of ours, our emotion, our feelings, our everything else that will decide at the end volitionally in which way we're going to respond. Friends, this must be subjected to control by the Spirit of God. And so that's why be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace of when Jesus Christ is revealed. Therefore, like this, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you live in ignorance. That when we are held back, therefore, in our ignorant ways and allow our wills to be directed by the flesh, we find that we will not be able to respond in a manner that will honor God, isn't it? In our volition, in our decision, uh, in our life. And therefore, we find that the Apostle Peter tells us that on one hand, our mind must be renewed so that it will be ready for action in a right, in a proper manner. But also on the other hand, we notice here, friends, Apostle Peter says, be self-control uh, as well. And that's important for us so that our wills, when it is submitted to the will of God, we will be able to live lives of honor that will glorify his name indeed. There's one final thing, friends, of Apostle Peter is concerned about, and I believe this is emphasis uh, for us, and that's how I want to draw this uh, to a close. Because Apostle Peter says, not only minds ready for action through its renewal, wills under the control of the Spirit of God, but third and finally, friends, lives that are holy before Him. Lives that are holy before Him. And so verse 15, Peter writes, But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. Friends, there's a call for sanctified living. There's a call to be separated from sin and to be set apart totally and fully for God. And so in this holy living, negatively, we notice here Peter says this, back again to verse 14. Peter says, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you live in ignorance. We must put aside, put away our ways that are wrong, our ways that are evil, our ways that are flesh fleshly, our ways that will conform to uh, the person in us of the past. That's the first thing we need to put aside negatively for all of us. But also Peter says negatively, right, in chapter 2 and in verse 1 like this, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, every wrongdoing and act. Peter wants us likewise to be putting this aside whereby when there is sometimes envy and jealousy amongst one another, competition that will take place. I know sometimes when we come together in our ministries, we begin to compare with one another how we are doing. And uh, sometimes some of us, we feel that we are so much better off than another ministry because uh, we have really seen uh, God at work in a wonderful way. And others of us, we don't feel a lot of progress in our work. Uh, we feel really bad about it. And friends, that's a whole area of envy and jealousy that can come in, isn't it? 
and sometimes even for some of us coming together in our churches, uh, there is the competitive spirit that can take place. Isn't it? In fact, in this meeting in Brazil that I mentioned, basically it is uh, what we call Global Kingdom Partnership Network. It is basically made up of senior pastors of large churches around the world, churches in the thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands, really, that we decided that we will come together from the two-thirds world of Asia, Africa, and Latin America to see how we can be networked together for a number of reasons. Firstly, we say this is basically a gathering of friendship. We want to be friends first. Secondly, it is a gathering together of uh, encouragement, mutual encouragement, inspiration in the work of the Lord. Thirdly, it is a gathering together of accountability and responsibility towards one another. And fourthly, it is a gathering to see how we can partner for the advance of God's kingdom around the world. And that's the reason why we find that this year, last year we met in Cairo, this year we met in Sao Paulo, we invited key leaders of some mission agencies to come to talk together with us to see how best we can partner together for the advance of God's kingdom. So excited what our brother Peter said about the whole area of considering about partnership in a greater manner for the advance of God's kingdom. Amen, isn't it? And that's so important, isn't it? Because no matter how good we are, how big we are, none of us can do the work alone. Amen? We just need one another and more and more. And the more, the better, isn't it? Sometimes when people come to Malaysia and they say, I felt God calling me to Malaysia to plant a church. I say, welcome, my brother. All right, please send more. We need more uh, to come. Rather than some people sometimes very, very guarded about their turf, very protective about their turf. You have no business to be, to be here. If you want to go, go somewhere else except this place, isn't it? But friends, you know, the, the feel of God is too big for anybody, isn't it? The feel is just huge. And we need anyone and everyone to come in to work together it's as long as we're working together in partnership and not in competition, isn't it? And it's so important. That's the reason why I'm so delighted to be part of this kind of network to say that what can we do together to advance God's kingdom in a greater, in a faster pace, really? Because why? Time is short and life is precious. Amen. Or put the other way around, life is short and time is precious, isn't it? When I was a young little kid, seven, eight years old, when I looked up at a man, 50 years old, I thought, my goodness, he is so old. <laughs> but today, in the twinkling of an eye, I've gone way past 50 and touching 60 now. And those of you who are younger, don't laugh at us. Your time will come very soon. <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye, you will also join the company of the elect. That's a reality of time, is it, for all of us. I know we are all chasing after time. We are all trying to renew our spirit and our life, hoping that God will just continue to make us young all the time, is it? That the elixir of youth will enable us to press on so that we will fulfill as much as possible in this world that God has uh, put us in, isn't it? I know there's always a desire, always, okay, the longing to do that. I know age sometimes catch up with us. We find it hard and difficult. And that's why when two old men got together, 80-year-old men, 75-year-old men, you know, when old people get together, you know what is one thing they talk about? Memory loss. How their memory is fading. And so this 80-year-old man told the 75-year-old man, brother, you know, I have found a secret of helping to improve my memory, and my memory is improved by 50% now since I discovered this elixir right, for memory, help, and youth as well in the last few months. He said, really? What is it about? What is it so special? He said, yeah, there's a special soup I've been taking, and this special soup that I've been taking has really helped us. Where is it? Where do you take this soup from? From that restaurant, the special restaurant that my wife and I have been going. Really? Can you tell me the name of the restaurant so that I can go as well to help me to improve my memory as well? And so the 80 year old man said, you, you, know, you know, what is it that, that, uh, that flower? with uh, green leaf and thorns and uh, petals are red and sometimes white and, uh, you know, you know what, what, is that, what is that flower called? And, uh, and uh, the 75 year old man said, you, you, mean, you mean rose? He said, yeah, yeah, that's right, rose, rose. So, so he shouted to his wife, rose, okay, what? He 
He said, Rose, what's the name of the restaurant we've been going to? <laughs> I know time passes very quickly, isn't it? And we wish that we've got many more youthful years. But friends, the comfort encouragement, comfort encouragement we all have is this, that the latter years of our life can be better than the former years. Amen, isn't it? Right? Why? Because God can renew our years in spite of whatever. Why? Because age is only a number. Hello? Amen. Say to your neighbor, age is only a number, my friend. So if you think you are old, you are really old, isn't it? But friends, you know, we know there's an urgency about this whole work and ministry that God has given to us. And that's the reason why we find there is a need for partnership, isn't it? A need to really work together for the advance of God's kingdom. And that's what our desire is really, to draw in right, some key mission agencies to say, can we talk together? What is the reason? It is because the center of gravity of Christianity has shifted to the two-thirds world. That's a reality, isn't it? That there are more Christians today in Asia, Africa, and Latin America combined than the first world. And therefore, we're going to see if we are to be faithful stewards to see what we can do together rather than we work separately and differently or even competitively, isn't it? And there's a reason why next year when we meet in Seoul, uh, in Korea, we're going to draw others in together to see how we can form a greater global partnership like this so that God's work can go on even at a faster pace, isn't it? Because we all need one another like this. And therefore, Peter says, negatively in holy living, not conforming to the evil desires of our flesh, getting rid of all that is wrong, that is jealousy, hypocrisy, envy, or whatever kind. And then Peter goes on to talk about possibly what it means to live holy lives. And so Peter tells us like this, positively, firstly, he says, to live reverently. Verse 17 of chapter 1. Peter says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Live your lives in reverent fear before the Lord. Live in the fear of God. Because when we live in the fear of God, we become accountable and responsible for everything we do. I think sometimes the trouble with us, even as Christians, is that we do not fear God as much as we should, really. And because of this, we find that sometimes we don't do our work well. We don't have a spirit of excellence. But when there's a real fear of God, we know that God is always with us and watching us all the time. So that whether people see us or don't see it, it does not matter at all, isn't it? They're going to do things and do things really well. Why? Because it honors God. Because we fear Him, isn't it? In fact, just last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I've been preaching my church. In fact, I'm taking my church through this whole series on the Ten Commandments. For many years, I've been wanting to preach the Ten Commandments, but somehow God has been stopping me from it. And it is only this year, finally 30 years later, that God allowed me to preach in my church. And then I discovered the reason why. Because God revealed to me that the Ten Commandments is not just a series of do's and don'ts. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. It is not. The Ten Commandments is really a paradigm for the transformation of society. It is really the template for community change that when any society would base its foundation using the Ten Commandments as, as the template, that society, the community will be powerful and strong. And that's the kind of community society God wants to build. And that's why he gave it to his people. Why? Because when his people were built the society using the Ten Commandments at its basis of its operation, that society, any society, will be powerful, isn't it? And so, friends, the third commandment, for example, that I preach, which is not misusing God's name, it is not just not to use the name of the Lord in vain. More than that, friends, 
It is a fear of God, isn't it? Because when we don't misuse His name, there is a reverent awe and fear of Him and of His name, isn't it? And when there is a fear of God, we become accountable, responsible, everything we do, whether people know it, see it or not, it does not matter, isn't it? The trouble is today there is not enough fear of God. So that sometimes even we as Christians and Christian leaders, we do things unaccountably. There's a lack of transparency. And sadly, we all know it grieves the heart of God, isn't it? And friends, can I say, this fear of God should not just only reside in Christians. Strictly speaking, this fear of God should reside in the heart of every person, even those who are not Christians. And you and I can be sure, friends, when there is a fear of God across the board, then anyone and everyone in the community, in the society, will do things rightly and properly. You don't have to be a Christian to have a fear of God. You know that? You and I know, I'm sure I've come across some non-Christians. They really have a genuine fear of God. And therefore you know that in the business, in their work, in everything that they do, we find they do things responsibly. They do things accountably and transparently. And that's my prayer, I say to the whole church, for our nation. That's my prayer for the political leaders of our nation. In fact, yesterday morning, a depu the, the deputy foreign minister was in church, introduced him to the whole church. And uh, not because he was there that I spoke, but basically because I've been addressing this to the whole church again and again, that unfortunately sometimes, not only in Malaysia, but around the world, some politicians think they can do anything they want and get away with it. Because they are so powerful, and they think that they've got all the power in the world and there is no restriction for them to do anything and everything. Why? Because nobody can touch them. What a tragedy, isn't it? And that's why nation after nation in trouble. Why? Because political leaders at the top will do things and plunder the nation with no thought at all about the, the fact they'll be held accountable. But you and I, friends, seem to put a fear of God in their hearts. Why? Because the Word of God reminds us one day there is judgment to come. Whether we are Christians or not, it does not matter, isn't it? That one day we all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And therefore, when we can instill this fear of God in the hearts of people, we find that the community will never be the same again. Everything will be done responsibly and done well, isn't it? And that's important. And that's the reason why, friends, we notice here, we are told to live in reverent fear. Why? Because it's a reflection of a life of holiness in us. Secondly, friends, in living, holy living, Peter tells us like this in verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but an imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. To love one another deeply because what this, the Word of God tells us is what the Lord Jesus Christ Himself modeled for all of us, isn't it? That there's a genuine love for one another. That there is affirmation, commendation, encouragement. That we seek to bless. That we seek to lift up one another. That we seek to sometimes, many times, compliment one another when there are good work that has been done, isn't it? It's so wonderful to hear brothers and sisters and look forward to what's reports in the next few days to hear what God is doing around the world through your work and ministry, isn't it? And it's a time of rejoicing, time of celebration, time to say well done to one another, isn't it? Because I know sometimes, even as Christians, we are very hesitant about complimenting one another. Sometimes we are so sparse in our compliment that when we pay a compliment, we expect a receipt. Reminds me of this couple who went to the restaurant to eat. And so what happens is this, that uh, the waiter said, Sir, what is it you want? He said, I looked at your menu. Steak looks very good. So can I have a steak, please? please. Sir, how would you like it done? He says, well done, please. And so sure, the waiter wrote down. Half an hour later when the steak was served, what happens is he could see a bit of blood and that kind of thing on the steak. He was furious. 
this is not well done. This is rare, really rare, you know. And he called the waiter over, really upset, irritated by the, the kind of steak that has been served. And when the waiter came, he said to the waiter, I said, well done. And the waiter said, thank you very much, sir, for the compliment. I deeply appreciate it. Because in my life, there are few people who compliment you with what you compliment me now. Because every time when customers would call me, they will always either tell me or scold me, whatever. So thank you very much, sir, for complimenting by saying, well done. <laughs> what a kind of compliment. Friends, you know, you and I, when we see work that has been done well, we compliment, we say, well done. Because it's an expression of the heart, there's one form of really loving one another deeply from the heart, and that's important, I think, uh, for all of us as a people of God, isn't it? And so, in living holy lives positively, it is to live reverently, it is to love deeply, but also finally, friends, it is to lead exemplarily. Why? Because here Apostle Peter writes, let me skip on to chapter 2 and verse 12. Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Holy lives would mean lives that would model after the Lord Jesus Christ. Lives that are exemplary. Lives there will be one whereby it is so good that people cannot find fault with us, as it were. And that's the call, friends, for all of us. Because when we live holy lives like this, friends, we find that the enemy has no hold upon us. Neither can people accuse us. Why? Because we live holy lives. And friends, can I say, this is one bulwark against the attack of the enemy. This is one area whereby the enemy cannot have a hold upon our lives when we live lives that are holy. And friends, that's, I trust, important for all of us really, increasingly, as we press on in our work and our ministry. That holy living is one sure guard against the attack of the enemy. One sure protection as we press on in the work of God's kingdom. Sometimes sadly and tragically, friends, ministries, even mega ministries, implode because of a lack of holiness. And that's my prayer, really, very much for OM. God has established his great work in the last 50 years. Wonderful, powerful work. It's unbelievable when I tell friends from a small band of men, it has gone around to 114 nations around the world. And I believe one of the main reasons is because of the emphasis on holy living in the movement. Knowing George Verver well, here is one man who will confess any and every sin until you cannot find any blemish at all, as it were, at the end of his life. And I think God has honored that, I believe. And I believe many of your lives pattern after that very, very much. And indeed, if OM is going to march on just more and more and become powerful in God, holiness must be one characteristic mark of this movement so that it will press on strongly, courageously, to fulfill God's call. In a sense, the Methodist Church that I belong to is in a sense a holiness movement. And that's what John Wesley himself emphasized, that one of his mission on earth when he was alive is to spread scriptural holiness across the land. And I believe it is because of this that God has kept as it were, the Methodist movement alive. In fact, for the first 100 years of the existence of the Methodist movement, revival happened wherever it went. 
and then it circulated around the world. So that very soon we find that the Methodist movement has become one of the larger groups of uh, churches, whatever, around the world. And that's the reason why we find in many countries around the world, the Methodist Church is one of the largest denominations. What is the reason? Because of the emphasis on holiness. But of course, you and I know today, tragically and sadly, that has not, unfortunately, been the emphasis many times. And we all need to repent and ask God for forgiveness. And that likewise, friends, if OM is going to march on strong and powerful in God, that one mark of holiness that will characterize OM will continue to enable it to fulfill God's call upon it in a powerful manner. And I pray that this will be one whereby in your thinking, deliberation, everything else, it will be something, friends, in that holy living. The enemy cannot have a foothold. foothold. The world cannot destroy us. Why? Because we reflect what is true character of the Lord Jesus Christ, the holy servant of God that he has been called to and that you and I have been called to. Likewise, let us pray. Our Father, we give you praise and thanks that you're a good and wonderful God, a God of mercy and grace, but a God who is also altogether holy. And you have said to us, be holy, because I'm holy. So help us, O oh God, that we live such lives that people may see our good works and truly glorify you on the day you visit us. I pray, Father, O oh God, for your blessings upon the OM movement, for your protection. I pray for each one that all of us, Father, I ask, O oh God, will walk a life of holiness. And when there are wrongs and compromise and sins, we will run to you quickly and confess and repent. Not to run away from you, but to run towards you, O oh God, so that we put our lives right. Because a holy fear of you will draw us to want to worship you more and more. And not to cringe in terror. Help us, Father, I pray. So that truly, O oh God, our lives will reflect you rightly and properly as we live in this challenging, but also exciting times. We just worship and praise you. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. <laughs>